Before I begin, I'd like to thank some of my colleagues for making um, this um, joint sponsored talk possible. Um, beginning with the deans, Kirtana and Malafi, the head of the Department of Social and Civic Sciences, John Miller, um, as well as Professor Will Gore, Dr. Heiser, and Jackie Speedy, all these people around, both of the campus, Amanda Bernard, and Julius of the Fed. Um, the collaboration, this is how CMU works, the collaboration of the various departments and schools has um, grown over the years and it's a way to enhance the intellectual conversation at Carnegie Mellon. These conversations have raised the profile of the university nationally and internationally. And Dr. Campbell, uh, Chris Campbell, who is a contributor to our evolving conversation about politics, culture, markets, technology, and how we think this track. Dr. Kurt Campbell is the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Um, and he's let me know that he's known me for more than half my life, which is um, more time than most of my students have been in my work. Um, and it's not, um, it's not unsurprising that Dr. Campbell is described as a, as a foreign policy think tank for him. Um, he has an extensive resume in national and defense affairs, and it took me a long time to figure out how to cherry pick his resume. He has a distinguished career in ac um, academia, <coughs> policy, and government. He received his doctor doctorate in international relations from Oxford University, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Um, after graduate school, he became a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, where I met him, later an assistant and associate professor in Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. And the academic world, um, just a few of um, his positions have been um, also serving at, um, as a lecturer at Brown University and then as a member at um, St. Cross College at Oxford. He's written too many books and articles to, to um, um, books and articles to mention here, but there are quite a few um, from U.S. policy for East Asia, defense matters, um, terrorism, and on and on and on. In government, he's had a number of roles, um, being one being assistant, uh, special assistant to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, while serving as Missouri Game Officer. He's also served as Deputy Special Counsel to the President for NAFTA in the White House and was a White House fellow in the Department of um, Treasury. Prior to his current position at the State Department, where he runs um, our state policy, Dr. Campbell was CEO and co-founder of CMAS, the Center for, Nat for New American Security. He co-founded it with Michelle Florida, who is the highest ranking woman in the Pentagon. CMAS has become a force in Washington in the big tank world. Um, there are many, many think tanks in Washington, and they drown each other out, but the CMAS has found a way to distinguish itself as a nonpartisan research institution that works to develop principles, practical, and effective national security policy. Um, he has many honors, I won't read them all, but one includes Korea's national security board. Incidentally, um, Dr. Campbell's wife, Laurel um, Big um, Brainard, is currently Undersecretary of International Affairs at the Department of Treasury. She's the highest ranking woman ever in the Department of Treasury. She was the youngest tenured person in economics at MIT. And furthermore, Dr. Campbell has three daughters. Um, so please give me, uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to the well-rounded scholar, family man, statesman, Dr. Kirk. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. And it's just an honor to be here, and I'm so grateful. And you cannot have a better professor or colleague uh, than Karen. I think you all know that. And the work that she's done on uh, the uh, Reagan Diaries and uh, the work in the Cold War is really terrific. I got to know her when we were both much younger, and she was a wonderful colleague and friend then. And when she asked me to come, uh, to Pittsburgh, I said I would be more than happy to uh, visit uh, a city that actually has a football team as opposed to Washington. Um, many of you uh, probably watched the game last night and made very clear that we do not have a football team. 
Um, I was, uh, it's always striking when I hear a wonderful um, presentation or uh, sort of review of my bio and I reflect on how little it resembles my daily life and how completely out of whack my life is at a general level. So as Kyron indicated, my wife is at the Treasury Department right now, given the state of global economics and the G20. She is by an order of magnitude the most important person in our family and has just gotten back from uh, some uh, very critical interactions uh, in Korea and, and uh, Japan. And so last week, I have very young daughters, uh, the youngest of which is three are two and a half, and uh, so I, I don't know if any of you know what it's like if you're a dad and you're sort of raising your three daughters, so every morning is much more difficult than trying to negotiate a trade deal. So every girl from the time that we wake up between 5.30 and 8 in the morning has at least one horrible crying jag. And just to give you just a sense of what that's like, about a week and a half ago, I, was get, I had gotten the girls all up and they were all dressed. My oldest is 10 and she can be a little bit more helpful. And my younger, youngest one, two and a half, Coco, you have to just kind of be on her and kind of help her get through the day. But I took my eyes off her for just a nanosecond, literally a nanosecond, and I had spread her bagel with butter. She loves butter. And so she had been dressed, she was sitting at the table, and I was sort of focused on my other girls, brushing their hair, getting them ready uh, for school. And I turned back in a second, and my uh, little Coco had taken all her clothes off and was rubbing her body with butter. <laughs> butter like all over and being a good dad and I'm going I'm not going to be dad of the year but I'm, I'm going for most improved dad and and so I just broke down and said why why please please like that which dads do begging pleading not 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 fixing the problem but just basically whining and uh, my middle daughter who's a little bit more difficult said hey papa how's that diplomacy working for you <laughs> So um, anyway, so that's, that's really in truth what my life is really like, as opposed to sort of high flutin discussions of biography. So I, I'm here to talk to you today about, um, about Asia, and I'm going to talk about the United States and Asia. When Kyra and I first uh, started to work uh, together uh, many years ago at the Kennedy School, we were primarily focused on another large country and a large set of challenges on the Soviet Union and the Cold War that we were in the midst of. And I had uh, studied in the Soviet Union and I'd learned Russian, I'd done the whole thing. But right when we were sort of completing our graduate education, uh, we had come to the end of that period. And I found myself less interested in foreign policy, so I had a chance to work at the Treasury Department for a while. But I just wasn't interested as much in the, in the challenges of the new Europe or some of the uh, new issues that we were dealing with um, uh, on the global scene. So I had a chance, uh, one of our former colleagues, Joe Nye, who many of you may know, uh, the, sort of the architect of the concept of soft power, uh, said, well, why don't you come over and work with me at the Pentagon on Asia? And at that time in the mid-1990s, it was like a giant world opened up to me and I realized that this was my passion, this was the area that I wanted to spend the rest of my life working on. And for the last 20 years, I've been spending almost every day thinking, reflecting, trying to strategize about what it means for the United States in terms of the Asian Pacific region. And let me give you some context if I can. If you, if you think about what Asia means and will mean for the United States, over the course of the next, oh, several generations. I think it is undeniable that when people talk about the Asia Pacific century, we are living in it. We are in the midst of it now, although on many occasions it's not real to us and it doesn't feel as significant. So if you ask, if you look at recent Pew polling and other uh, uh, discussions that analyze uh, American thinking, not just sort of here but in the heartland, you ask most Americans, uh, where are we principally engaged in terms of foreign policy and national security? They will say uh, to almost a two to one margin that our primary focus, our primary arenas of engagement are in the Middle East and South Asia. Iraq, Afghanistan, Iran, Middle East peace process. Now these are undeniably important issues and they are uh, strategically very challenging. 
But um, I think by almost any measure, if you ask historians 30 or 40 or 50 years from now and ask them to look back on this period and say, where, where is the sort of the, the cockpit of global power? Where is the major issues uh, that are playing out in global politics? Uh, where do they reside? Uh, the answer, I think, increasingly is going to be in the Asian Pacific region. And so just as someone told me, I remember as an undergraduate, uh, saying, well, <clears throat> where should I focus on? Uh, you know, in addition to what else I'm doing, my number one suggestion to all of you is think much more deeply, reflect both professionally and in terms of languages on Asia, because that's really going to be where the future of the United States lies at almost every level. Let me try to give you some sort of uh, uh, meat for those bones to understand what the nature of this change is and what it means for the United States. Uh, today, as we speak, every year, basically 1% of global economic uh, activity shifts to Asia. Uh, by orders of magnitude, the fastest growing economies are in uh, China, in Southeast Asia, and increasingly in India. China's growth for the last uh, 10 or 15 years has been at about 10% a year. It's the most uh, dominant increase in, uh, in uh, global GDP in history. If you look at the World Bank studies about poverty reduction, just to give you for instance, if you subtract the number of people that have been raised from poverty, uh, out of poverty uh, uh, in China from the global numbers, you recognize that the only place that you've had a real systematic success in poverty alleviation uh, in the aggregate is in China. And I think we'll have a similar process, we hope, over the course of the next 15 or 20 years in uh, India as well. So you have uh, massive economic uh, uh, capabilities that are on display on almost a regular basis. And it poses very significant, sometimes severe, economic and political challenges to the United States. At the same time that there's this enormous promise of economic activity, there are also enduring challenges and difficulties associated with the Asia-Pacific region. Let me give you a couple of examples. Um, basically, uh, every country in Asia has a problem with one or more of its neighbors. And the interesting thing about uh, the Asian quote, quote, community is how little trust and confidence there is generally among its various members. And one of the reasons why the United States has been so successful as a guarantor of peace and stability in Asia. If you think about uh, what the role the United States has played in Asia, for the last 30 or 40 years, we have about 100,000 American military forces, soldiers, sailors, Marines, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and airmen who uh, have served to, to protect and project American uh, uh, power in the Asian Pacific region. You ask why has that, that been so successful? One of the reasons is that Asians tend to view the United States as a relatively distant power, but one that has uh, uh, essentially been a stabilizing force in the politics of the Asian Pacific region. When you think about Asia, one of the things that Asians will tell you right off the bat is don't use European analogies when describing complex situations in Asia because Asians will immediately realize that you don't understand their politics. You have simply imported different political, uh, 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 different political stories or experiences uh, to try to understand what plays out in Asia. All that being said, my favorite analogy, my favorite story that I think has enormous relevance for Asia comes from Europe. So I'll just, I'll just now violate the principle that I just laid out. In the 1980s, Lord Carrington was the Secretary General of NATO under Margaret Thatcher. And <clears throat> he was sitting around in a meeting at NATO in which the Italians, the French, and the Germans, and the British were going on and on about the United States, that we were clumsy, that we didn't coordinate very well, that we had no culture, that we were stupid, uh, that we were blundering, sort of over-muscled uh, uh, global players. And after about 25 minutes of this, Lord Carrington turned to his various assemblage 
of diplomats and said, ah, alas, they are the only Americans we have. And in many respects, that role is uh, repeated again in the Asian Pacific region. We, the United States, is, are the power as you have many changes, rising states, falling states, uh, proliferation challenges and the like, that almost every country in the Asian Pacific region can look to as a stabilizing factor and force uh, in global politics. So what are the challenges? What, what, what's playing out in Asia right now that matters for the United States? One of the most uh, challenging uh, uh, things that the United States is going to have to deal with over the course of the next generation is the rise uh, onto the scene of another great power. China's rise into global politics, probably followed almost immediately by India's, um, promises to be one of the most important changes in global politics probably uh, of the last hundred years. And anyone who has studied what is called hegemonic uh, uh, theory, I think you've all worked on uh, Gilpin and others, or Joe Nye, recognizes that these periods of hegemonic change are inherently challenging. So when you have an established power like the United States, and a set of rules and a set of institutions in place, but then a rising state like China that de demands and expects to play a larger role, to have greater sway in a variety of uh, interactions, that um, conversation, that negotiation can be very complicated. And so one of the things that I experience on a daily basis is the nature of that, of that conversation. So I interact with Chinese interlocutors extraordinarily regularly and trying to figure out how the United States and China can work together productively to ensure that the Asian Pacific region and indeed global politics can remain steady and stable is one of the most important features of American foreign policy. And that's extraordinarily difficult because the United States is facing very real challenges economically right now, but so is China, a massive movement of uh, rural people to urban cities, huge problems in terms of gaps between rich and poor, and enormous environmental and labor problems, right? So very challenging. But that relationship, getting that right, will be one of the most important dimensions of American foreign policy over the course of the next 20 to 30 years. And it will be extremely difficult, and there will be tensions involved. And you saw those on full display uh, recently when President Obama was both in Korea and in Japan for the G20 and the APEC discussions. As the President is making clear that there needs to be adjustments in our sort of economic relationship with the United States, saving more and Chinese friends buying more from the United States in terms of exports. And that we cannot go back to a situation where we are the uh, purchaser of last resort, where we are the, basically the engine of, of, of global growth, that we no longer have the wherewithal to essentially uh, take on relatively inexpensive Asian uh, uh, capital and then use it to uh, purchase uh, large amounts of uh, exports, uh, imports into the United States. And that increasingly that the United States must, there must be a global rebalancing agenda. And that was the subject of substantial debate in discussion at the G20 uh, that took place in, in Seoul, Korea uh, just over the weekend. So that's just one of the challenges that we're dealing right now. Also, uh, the United States is in the midst of trying to negotiate a different kind of relationship with India. Um, the United States uh, and India are two uh, very old democracies. Uh, we should, by all accounts, be much closer than we are. But for a variety of reasons, we've had challenges finding ways to work together productively. But over the course of the last 10 years, first with very able leadership from President Bush and now hopefully followed by President Obama, we are seeing a relationship between the United States and India take root. And despite its difficulties, it's extraordinarily important in terms of what it promises to global uh, prosperity and greater strategic cooperation as a whole. Um, it has been said that President Obama is our first Asia Pacific president, right? Now you could quibble, you know, you could say, well, you know, uh, President uh, 
Uh, President Nixon was born in California. Others had more uh, experience as well. But the truth is, what's interesting when you spend time with President Obama, he, um, you know, he, he spent a, a, a large part of his youth in Indonesia uh, and grew up in Hawaii. So he has, I'm struck when I sit down, and you're always nervous when you're briefing him, his level of knowledge about Asia is much higher than you would normally uh, you know, find in just an everyday person who thinks about global politics. He is deeply knowledgeable and has a vision of where he'd like to take the United States going forward. So, so what is that? You know, where do you think the United States should be going in the Asian Pacific region? And the, the elements of that strategy are, are several fold. I will say uh, there is also, I think, lurking uh, beneath all of this a much larger challenge that, frankly, the United States and other countries have not yet effectively addressed. Um, if you ask me, you know, what's the biggest challenge in global politics over the course of the next 30 to 40 years? It's not rising states. It's not proliferation. It's not the mistreatment of women and girls, although all of these issues are critically important. The dominant issue that is going to be extraordinarily difficult for global politics is the, what are the security implications of climate change? And I think we are going to find in everything that we have seen in uh, recent months and years in terms of new evidence suggests that the path and pace of global warming is much more rapid, much more destabilizing, and much more worrisome than even the most worried of us uh, thought about just a couple of years ago. And if you think about the most recent studies associated with the melting uh, of the Arctic and you sort of imagine what a two feet rise in sea level uh, would mean, Devastating for the United States, but think about what it would mean for Asia. Give me a sense, if you had a two-foot rise in sea level, how many people are on the move in Asia? Just roughly, give me a rough number. How many people would be forced to relocate given that rise in sea level? Just roughly. Anyone? 400 million. Anyone else? Pardon me? One billion. Getting closer. It's about be somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 billion people. So in a sense, from my, from my view, I mean, look at the fragile infrastructure of all these states, and indeed of the United States. These kinds of potential challenges, very hard to imagine. They're, they pose existential threats. And so one of the things that's going to be very clear going forward is that climate change will, you know, the drivers of climate change are found in the Asian Pacific region. Most of the biggest contributors, including the United States, are Asian Pacific players. So the problem and the solutions, if there are to be solutions, are found with this, within the, this constellation of states, right? So um, I think what um, the United States will need to do over the course of the next several years is reapportion its general uh, level of engagement. And so we, we must finish successfully what we've started in Iraq and Afghanistan, despite you know, debates about you know, how we got there, where we are. I think we have a moral and strategic imperative to uh, do uh, the best we can to complete those missions. But overall, we're going to have to recenter some of our strategic uh, approach more towards the Asian Pacific region. And so when you ask yourself, what is the scarcest resource at the top of the U.S. government, right? Obviously, it's the, you know, the uh, money, treasure, you know, the lives of, of uh, our young men and women. But one of the scarcest resources is the time and, and attention of our senior most officials. And so what you're struck with is that even in an environment where there's a deep recognition uh, of the importance of Asia. There's just not enough time to deal with some of the issues that really confront this generation of Americans. And we're going to have to create the context uh, of that environment over the course of the next uh, couple of years. So, so if you go about thinking about what's your strategy, right? It has to be multi-pronged to be uh, effective. The first is, uh, the first element of that strategy would be this, in my view. The United States has been blessed, unlike uh, Europe, in which we've basically managed our relationship through an inc incredibly successful institution, NATO, for uh, decades, right? 
Asia uh, has still very young and fledgling institutions with very shallow roots, right? Most of the relationships that the United States have are with bilateral countries, deep bilateral security ties with Japan, with South Korea, with Australia, with, uh, with um, the Philippines and Thailand. And nurturing and sustaining those political and strategic ties are among the most important elements of a strategy that uh, the United States uh, has to be involved with. And so what you've seen over the course of the last decade, but really picked up, I think, in the last um, year or two under Secretary Clinton and President Obama, is a deep desire to strengthen those bilateral ties. And so we spent a lot of time, uh, strategic discussions, interactions with these countries about our various uh, 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 perspectives in global politics. You will note that all of those countries, except for you know, the challenges that you have in Thailand, are democracies, right? And it's easier at some level, at a strategic level, having these shared aspirations, goals, and values when it comes to uh, governments as a general, uh, governance as a general proposition. A second element of strategy is to identify clearly those rising states in the Asian Pacific region that are likely to play a bigger role in global politics going forward. Now, what are those states? We've already talked about India. Clearly, India is going to play a much larger role, and that's one of the reasons why President Obama spent so much time on this recent trip appealing to the Indian Parliament, reaching out on issues associated with nuclear power and the like. But there are other states as well. Indonesia, if you had to make a list of those countries that were important to the United States, and important to global politics that the United States did not even recognize were important. That's kind of an awkward category, but if you imagine that category, probably at the top of that list is Indonesia. It's the world's uh, largest democracy. Uh, it is the, uh, uh, one of the largest Muslim states in the world. Uh, a pluralist, uh, a generally tolerant interpretation of Islam. Uh, widespread uh, tens of thousands of islands, uh, and uh, also the place, who would have imagined that we'd ever have a president who grew up speaking Bahasa, right, who spent a good part of his life there. So that trip that he had last week, in many respects, was like a homecoming for him. Building a stronger, deeper relationship with Indonesia will be essential. But there are other states in Asia that are going to be important as well. What's the biggest surprise for Americans when you travel to Asia? is that the most obvious country that is desirous of a deeper engagement with the United States is Vietnam. And so when you go to Vietnam, it is almost disorienting because to a certain generation of Americans, Vietnam is really not a country in many respects or even a culture. It's a war and something that did not end particularly well for the United States. And so what's astonishing when you go there is the depth of desire among its political class and its uh, business people uh, to want a deeper relationship with the United States. Uh, it's also true that Vietnam has some very real challenges of human rights and issues of treatment of religions, but overall, at a strategic level, a much uh, uh, enhanced uh, interest in a closer relationship with the United States. So first part of this is a clear desire for strengthening our relationship with our partners. Second, identifying those countries that are arriving on the scene that you need to have a, a, a clear uh, a, and positive relationship. Third is a recognition that you've got to get your relationship with China right. And one of the things for Americans that I think you need to recognize going forward is that the United States has no experience with the kind of complexity uh, that we're going to have with our relationship with China. There are those who talk about containment, uh, who talk about sort of a latter-day Soviet Union. Nothing could be further from the truth. And, and in fact, if you look at U.S. engagement of China, China growing 10% a year, uh, deep desire to engage China in most of our major institutions, the G20, this is not containment. This is very different. It is a desire to work closely with an emerging uh, state on the global scene. But if you look at the Soviet Union, that relationship was like black and white, monochrome. 
you know, good, evil, whatever, you know, you know who your friends. China, much more complicated. We will always have elements of competition uh, and probably areas of distrust, but we will, those will be matched by areas where there, where there is a clear desire and need for the United States and China to cooperate. And the key here is how to figure out ways where you can maximize that cooperation, right? But also uh, limit and deal effectively with areas where you have difficulties. Difficulties associated with territorial issues, with Tibet, with Taiwan, with the South China Sea, with the handling of uh, Nobel Prize winners that are under arrest. All these issues are incredibly difficult. And China, as a rising state, as a state that um, very successfully managed the contours of the Asian economic crisis two years ago, much more so than the United States, and is now feeling itself in global politics, right? How we engage with China during this period is probably the most important challenge in global politics, in my view. So, so spending time thinking about that, having patience, knowing where to, uh, uh, where to put your focus, how to make your expectations clear. This is a critical feature of American foreign policy. Fourth, institutions. If we are to be ultimately successful in Asia, we need deeper, more sustainable institutions. And what's interesting about the institutions, and you compare them to Europe, everyone knows about uh, the uh, NATO, CSCE, all these institutions that basically kept the peace, built trust and confidence, in the, Asian, in the European uh, domain for 50 years. There's no comparable group of institutions in Asia. There are, there are a ton of them, ASEAN Regional Forum, APEC, East Asia Summit, Summit, ASEAN Plus Three, but they all have one thing generally in common, that their agendas are actually quite narrow, and they're very careful, and they're lowest common denominator. And so what you have is basically a class of leaders and foreign policy specialists who spend all their time on airplanes flying to these various meetings, right? And I think one of the jobs of the United States, and we've decided to enter the East Asia Summit, is to try to put more meat on the bones of this organization, to have a deeper dialogue and a truer dialogue about the issues that really confront Asia, climate change, terrorism, nuclear proliferation in North Korea, and be honest about those issues and get people to discuss them more openly. And the truth is that's deeply discomforting oftentimes in a larger setting in Asia, right? So the nature of the political discourse in these larger organizations in Asia is utterly different from the kind of culture that has emerged over decades in the United States and in Europe. And realizing that, and, and hopefully the United States adapting to some of that, right? We just can't come in and say, do it our way. We have to listen, we have to be careful. But at the same time, carefully nudging these institutions forward is going to be critical as we go forward. And then lastly, and I'm looking for, I'll take questions or comments or whatever. Lastly, if you travel around Asia and they ask people what matters most, they say, well look, your security commitment, your commitment to values and principles is important, but ultimately what really matters is that the United States it remains a confident, optimistic economic player in uh, the Asian Pacific region. And truth be told, over the course of the last couple of years, quietly, because Asian friends don't confront you with this very generally, they just think about it privately, there has been a substantial amount of discourse about whether the United States is in the midst of decline, right? And, and most of that debate is not about whether we're in de decline, but what is the angle of that decline, right? What's the angle of the repose? And, and early in the economic crisis, there was a lot of concern that the staying power of the United States was uh, uh, seriously in question. Now, I believe that um, a number of things have contributed to refuting that generally. The first is the example of history. And the truth is we have seen this story many times before. In 1975, at the end of the Vietnam War, another difficult period in American history, lots of discussion about the end of American power, only to see, uh, again, the United States continuing to play a dominant role in the region, right? At the end of the Cold War, the most 
obvious expression of American decline that one would hear in Asia was that the Cold War is over and Japan has won, right? Uh, and the sense uh, uh, that uh, uh, global politics had shifted dramatically in Tokyo's favor. Um, only to find several years later that the United States again uh, uh, resurfaced and reinvented itself economically and politically to play a dominant role in the Asian Pacific region. Now my general optimistic belief is that because of a variety of factors, our educational capacities, the enormous inventiveness in the U.S. Uh, uh, society and other features suggest that the United States is going to continue to play a very dominant role in global politics for the next 30 to 40 to 50 years. And I think that's very much in our interest. And that's something that I think has to be factored in into the calculus in most Asian leaders thinking right now. And I think that's generally good and I think that's played out. But Asian friends <clears throat> want us to play a more active role in the trade economic lifeblood of Asia. And they're worried. They're worried about protectionism. They're worried that the United States has lost some of its confidence and that we're backing away uh, from some of this engagement. People often refer to the various economic institutions of Asia as like a spaghetti bowl. Spaghetti bowl. They're so mixed, so many of them. And the United States is only engaged in a couple. Now, we're in the final stages, hopefully, in trying to secure the Korea Free Trade Agreement. And we're also uh, in the midst of beginning really consequential uh, uh, negotiations on what's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But ultimately, for the United States to be successful in Asia, we've got to be economically, commercially, financially engaged. We've got, to, we've got to relish that challenge. We've got to take that upon us and drive forward rather than pull back, right? So let me conclude with this. So what ultimately, as you, you all are strategists, you think about foreign policy, how would you think, how would you conceptualize this overarching choice for the United States? I would say as a general uh, um, practice or as a general uh, theory, Asia as a whole, but China in particular, are rising. And it's becoming much more important, right? And it will become more important over time. And in a fundamental way, the choice for the United States has been framed in two camps. And the first camp has been one that has been made essentially more um, prominent by neoconservatives during the latter part of the last decade. And that general thesis was that the primary focus of American foreign policy should be to secure American power and dominance for as long as possible. That in and of itself, the preservation, the sustainment of American power was in the strategic best interest of not only the United States, but the world as a whole. So that, that, that trying to ensure that the United States continued to play a dominant role should be a key feature of American foreign policy. And that should be taken on by substantial efforts in terms of military spending, variety of other things. Then there is a second group that has uh, primarily argued that the primary future of American foreign policy should not be such a quixotic quest. And that that would be uh, seen as being too provocative, uh, expensive and ultimately unnecessary. And that the key feature of American foreign policy should be to take steps to prepare for the inevitable multipolarity that's coming, right? That states are emerging and that is to create the ground rules and the institutions that make other states want to work with you to maintain this global system that the United States, along with other states, has built and nurtured for decades. And if I can give you just a quick analogy, just to keep in mind something along these lines. The truth is most of these states want to join these groups. They want to join these clubs that the United States and other countries. But how much longer will they want that before they want to create their own states, their own organizations, right? I remember I, I had, had the good fortune to study at Oxford, and at the end of my time at Oxford, I lived in London for a couple of years, and I remember I had these British friends, and they said, oh, very, very exciting, Kurt. Um, 
we think we're going to be able to get you into this very, very special club. It's going to be hard. Lots of lot, you know, a lot of character testaments. We're going to have a lot of letters written. We're going to have to look at your birth certificate and go back. And I thought, oh, it's really, really exciting. And so after you know eight months of letters and interviews, I was finally allowed to join. I remember I was very excited. I went to lunch there the first time, and I th I looked around. And I said. This is just an old rundown club, you know? And so there is, there, but there is a quality of wanting to join that you find among many of these countries in the Asian Pacific region in particular. But I would say, simply put, just as the first one is inadequate, right? The second one by itself probably uh, sends the unintended signal of American uh, withdrawal or uh, limits of American power. And so I think the real key feature of American foreign policy in Asia, in particular, is to try to match these two schools simultaneously. Sustain American power and leadership where you can, and at the same time, take the inevitable necessary steps to prepare the world for a time in which the United States is one state among many who are involved in not only the dominant economic but political relations uh, of our time. Now, I'll conclude with this, but if you guys want to have any questions, I've, had a, I've been in the shop for about a year and a half. I've had just some wonderful experiences. One of them has been I was the key guy who got to negotiate uh, with the, unsuccessfully, by the way, very unsuccessfully, with the, um, uh, the junta in Burma and had two very long meetings with Aung San Suu Kyi. Many of you may have seen she was finally released from prison two days ago. We were all thrilled by that. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this, I'd be happy to assist you. And I, again, it's great to be here. And uh, I don't know, Karen, do we take questions now? Or how do we? I take, I take questions. So if I could, if I could ask you if people do have questions or comments, just identify so I know where you're from. And yeah. Uh, I, I'm actually a Nixon. You're, you're a what? University of Pittsburgh. OK. I was wondering, you said, uh, you know, we need to balance our relationship with the right kind of stuff. There's also a data in the whole. Well, it seems to me that the United States Look, I, I think uh, let's take the issue of Taiwan. What we've tried to be very clear with uh, is that we support the dialogue that's taken place between the two sides. We, our primary interest is in the process through which the, these issues are worked out. We insist that it's peacefully. Uh, we insist that it is done with the requisite support of a demo democratic uh, uh, population uh, in uh, Taiwan uh, uh, generally. Uh, these issues are very difficult. Some of them are hard to solve and that they only can be managed. South China Sea, our general, uh, uh, and you all know South China Sea is an uh, area of, of contested waters uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, the United States has recently made clear that we seek uh, a uh, process, a diplomatic process, whereby China and the various contestants through ASEAN uh, uh, develop a legal uh, framework uh, uh, in ASEAN through uh, basically taking an agreement that they signed in 2002, a code of conduct, and making that sort of the, the process whereby some of these issues can be discussed in, a, uh, uh, in an overall uh, acceptable and uh, uh, framework that, that basically guards the interests of all involved, including China. Um, I, I think that some of these issues by nature are difficult and they require, and they involve uh, uh, some uh, uh, challenge in terms of different principles and different goals. And I think one of the most important things on the part of the United States is to be very consistent with our overall policy. So for instance, on Taiwan, our overall policy has been essentially the same for the last almost 30 years. And that consistency, I think, adds a degree of uh, predictability to the overall relationship as a whole. Yes, hi. Me? You, yes, you. <laughs> hi, um, my name is Karen, and I'm a graduate of the SAIS. Um, graduate of Social Studies? Sai, you know, SAIS, Johns Hopkins, SAIS Hopkins oh, yes, Center. Yeah. yeah. So I'm fluent in Chinese. 
and I'm very knowledgeable about Chinese contemporary culture. Good, good for you. And um, I'm thinking, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm also based on the the, the foundations of our institution of, of John Top, um, the Hopkins Nanjing Center, mm -hmm. were founded. So I see the vision in connecting with China, but at the same time, there's like the concrete. Um, reality, uh, the day-to-day -day reality, and also educating the citizens as well as, as a responsibility. So I'm thinking like from a cultural perspective, that's the way I, I look at things more in that way than a political perspective, that it's important to um, how to see China as an ancient country with a lot of rich culture. It's very complex and Absolutely. dynamic. So I think that's a really important thing totally to emphasize agree. because America is so so different at the same, so like the opposite. You have a you have a very you have the most diverse country in the world. You have the most homogenous country in the world with the longest continuous civilization. So I think that's really important. I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Let me. I'm, I'm very very glad that you raised this. Let me, the project that I'm most uh, I can't say most proudest of. I'm very proud of. Um, at the State Department is one that we've started in the last uh, year, and it's called 100,000 Strong. And it is a program whereby over the course of the next four years, we want to increase the number of Americans that study in China by 100,000. Now that may not seem like a, not, that is a huge, just dramatic magnitude increase. And so that's new scholarships, new monies, new opportunities for not just people studying political science, but engineers, doctors, and the like, to have the opportunity to study in China. We've made huge progress to date, and that's going to be when, when President Hu Jintao comes to Washington in January, we are going to sort of uh, discuss why this is so important. And so it's not just Chinese students come to the United States to learn about the United States. It's incredibly important to increase the number of Americans that study in uh, China, and not just China, it's other countries in Asia. Generally speaking, we have seen, um, except for China, the number of Americans studying abroad in Asia go down over time. That is just not in our interest strategically. And so we're trying to buck those numbers up in Japan and South Korea and Indonesia. But basically, at the center of this has to be a deeper knowledge of China. Almost everyone who goes and studies in China finds the experience difficult and bedeviling and challenging, but ultimately deeply, profoundly enriching. You loved it. No, but you don't, the initial, most Americans, like one of the things that we're doing right now, we're doing an inventory of all, Ameri all Chinese universities, where Americans might go over the course of the next couple of years. Let me, let me just say, we, 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 you know, we're deeply involved in this, and you ask Americans what they want in their abroad education. Many Americans don't understand, like, what the, you know, like, Yes, there will be a toilet, but it'll be a couple of floors down, and you can use it, you know, a couple of times a day. You know, so it's, you know, it's a very different system, very different standards, but to get Americans prepared for, you know, what that would be like, right? And sort of the adventure. And we want people that, with your kind of spirit that want to do this. Yes, and then I'll come to you. Okay, I'll take two more quick, okay? We'll take them together, so... Yes, I talked too long. I'm out of the habit of talking. I apologize for going on so long. So go ahead. Hi, I'm a Japanese major at the University of Pittsburgh, so naturally I have a Japan-related question. Good. Um, the 2004 National Defense Program um, guidelines in Japan are currently being revised to accommodate the security situation for the next 10 years. Given the regime change, do you think that the DPJ will revise the guidelines and the um, the principles on arms exports to meet the trends in the world and less of an emphasis on U.S. based security or more of a status quo? It's a great question. Go ahead. What do I think about this? Yes. I'm going to take you right there so I get it. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about um, security in Asia, actually. China is very populated in a high growth country and to the north Russia is um, underpopulated and low growth. Is there a possibility for a territorial push in the future? Will China try to expand its borders? Guys, these are great questions. All right, okay. Sorry, I didn't I, my peripheral vision, so Good. Yeah. 
Uh, let's do Burma first, and then um, since we had two questions on Burma. Look, um, we've tried this engagement strategy over the course of the last year and a half, year. I think it'd be fair to say we're deeply disappointed across the board. Very little progress on any of the issues that we've sought. Release of political prisoners, dialogue with uh, internal stakeholders, both ethnic groups, also with other political parties. Clearly the election has been without legitimacy. Um, and the only thing that's happened basically is the release of Aung San Suu Kyi. And she has made very clear that she wants a dialogue with the leadership. We support that process. We'd like that to come to pass. We want a dialogue with stakeholders. When I met with Aung San Suu Kyi, one of the things that she basically said was that we must be in a situation in which uh, there is a role for the military in society and there needs to be a dialogue between myself and others and uh, the government. We're in a situation now where it's, it's a very difficult, where Aung San Suu Kyi and her compatriots have enormous moral standing and very little real power. And the military, the junta, uh, Tang Shui, have enormous power, military and other sort of um, uh, coercive power and almost no, no moral authority. And so there's going to need to be some sort of overall process over the course of the next several years to create a more legitimate structure inside the country. Burma has enormous challenges, as you know well, huge ethnic uh, uh, difficulties, lots of uh, 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 problems of poverty, of horrible malnutrition, uh, problems in agriculture across the board. Uh, I, I uh, have encouraged all of our friends in ASEAN to take a more public role and to acknowledge that the, the overall approach that they have taken, which is just hope for the best, has not succeeded overall. So, so that, that, that would be my general view, although I will say that, you know, history is about movements and strategic. Aung San Suu Kyi is, by an order of magnitude, the most Im impressive person I've worked with uh, 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 over a substantial period of time. And I think the United States has been very clear about both the Nobel Prize winner in China and in Burma in terms of what we'd like to see. And it is troubling that, that Asia, this dyna dynamic region, that two uh, Nobel Prize win winners are imprisoned, one just released, and one in exile. And that, that's, that's difficult. That suggests enduring problems as a whole. Ma'am, to your question, your very good question, that's an excellent question. My sense is that the current government has come to realize that it has a lot of challenges, as you know well. Issues associated with reform and trying to get out of the economic doldrums. I think they've decided that having a relationship with the United States is their best course of action and that they need a close relationship with Washington and the United States given the challenges in their neighborhood. So I expect the midterm defense plan to have mostly elements of continuity. There will be some areas that, uh, of divergence, but I think those will be also essentially favoring to a better, stronger relationship between the United States and Japan. Ultimately, we need a strong, confident Japan. And what we worry about is the collapse of public support, you know, first with the LDP, but now we're seeing a similar process play out in the DPP. We want a strong public, you know, public mandate for an effective government in Tokyo and some, con some constancy and stability. And so that's what we're looking for more than anything else. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure to be here.